Hello everyone, welcome to our next webinar. Um, seems to be somewhat appropriate that it's going to be on the topic of icy worlds. Just before we get going, um, just a few brief announcements. In the uh, email that went out this week, just in case anyone didn't notice it, there is a link there to um, podcasts of all of these previous webinars. And I mention that because I know it can be difficult to watch the webinars um, directly on your computer, and particularly in real time. So if you want to download them and catch them later, and you can even listen to them at double speed, then just follow that link. The slides for today's presentation are already linked on the event in the website. So if you want to download them and follow along, you certainly can. Uh, our videos are up to date, and the video of this presentation will be up um, in a day or so. And uh, this is the only presentation that we're doing this week. Uh, the one that was scheduled for this week, or for Thursday, is being rescheduled to slightly later in January. And then just finally, we are being recorded, and that includes both what you say and what you type, just so you're aware of that. Okay, with that, Paulie. Okay, thank you very much, Andy, and um, hi, everyone. Uh, if you can't hear me, please let me know. Uh, it's nice to see so many participants here. Uh, so my name is Pauli Lane, and I'm from Finland. And uh, with me here are Penny Poston and uh, Kelsey Singer. They can uh, maybe introduce themselves if they like a little later. But uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, here a topic about uh, did life or prebiotic uh, chemistry evolve on biological different ice worlds? And uh, here each slide will be presented by a corresponding author, so we will talk by turns. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get started. So what's this all about? Uh, <clears throat> so icy bodies present some of the clearest evidence for liquid water on Kloposki. Uh, and so if uh, water is necessary for life, these bodies present attractive ac target to search for life or prebiotic chemistries. <clears throat> and in our planetary system, especially Europa, and in the Ladus presents the most likely examples of different icy worlds with possible subsurface oceans or lenses. So it's all about possible water on these bodies. Then uh, there is this justification part. And uh, first of all, uh, finding life or some prebiotic chemistry will establish, establish uh, the bounds for life beyond Earth. There are quite quick different places from our rocky planet Earth where we know only life can exist today. Uh, uh, ten, in, uh, any indicators of life or prebiotically relevant chemical processes could shed light on fundamental questions about the origin of life. So we don't know how how the life gets started in the first place. So if we could find some biomarkers there, some icy world, then it, it could shed some light on the about the origin of Western about the origin of life. Then if there are really habitable the icy moon may exist that of rocky planet ter terrestrial primary planets like Earth and thus be an extremely important plan planetary class for astrobiology to investigate. 
That means uh, uh, we don't have found any exomoons yet, but they, they might, might outnumber the Earth-like rocky planets. We don't know. Okay, then there is a series of sub-questions related to this topic. And the first one is, uh, why in first place we might expect to find uh, life and how we could expect that the life could emerge or be sustained in the icy world. Okay, first of all, the habitability of icy world as yet is as yet poorly assessed. We don't know if they are uh, habitable or not. Then subsurf uh, subsurface fluids uh, could offer up dense of liquid water habitats. Icy bodies may have an interior heat source derived from rocky core or be internally heated by tidal resonances with fellow moons and the primary planet. Life could have originated on an icy world. There, is, there are hypotheses, hypotheses about the origin of life uh, on Earth in the hydrothermal winds. So it's related to that. Or the life could have arrived on an icy body from elsewhere. There is a a new new paper about lithopanspermia, how how microbes could have been uh, transferred from Earth or Mars, where the life first emerged, to outer planets. And if no if no life is present, the detection of organic compounds produced on the icy body by intrinsic processes or sequestered and concentrated from outside sources may help us inform about the biotic processes on Earth and elsewhere. Uh, is this uh, okay. Penny? I think this is mine. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Penny Boston. I'm at New Mexico Tech as a faculty member and uh, I'm also Associate Director of the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. Um, our sub-question two uh, concerns how we can detect potential biomarkers either in or on icy worlds. This is quite challenging. Um, we infer that these geologically active bodies uh, have interactions between the surface and any possible subsurface ocean, whether it's wa liquid water or slush. Uh, fracturing uh, impactors from outside or various convective forces that may be within a plastic ice crust uh, that could be analogized to uh, uh, the mantle and crust relationship here on Earth could actually uh, bring some of the subsurface derived material uh, to the surface and that could be accessed uh, for analysis on missions. We certainly know that uh, uh, from several of the moons that we'll talk about in greater detail in a few minutes. Uh, we have observable uh, water and gas plumes that are emitted from fractures, and these, of course, uh, present a useful uh, mission target. Um, direct access to the subsurface ocean uh, via some sort of probe scheme has been suggested, and there have been several um, NASA workshops trying to figure out um, about those kinds of uh, access um, uh, methodologies. There are, of course, many caveats, and one uh, major one is the potential destructive alteration of any of the internal materials once they get exposed to um, a radiation and other challenging environments on whatever uh, body they're on. And, of course, the, uh, the technological feats involved in actually trying to conduct a mission to directly probe an ocean that is, uh, in some cases, 
tons of kilometers below the surface um, are quite challenging. Okay. Uh, so question number three. How can we conduct in situ tests for the existence of life and its byproducts or precursors on icy worlds? Uh, we find uh, three basic ways to do this. This kind of uh, testing is first of all, first of all, at, uh, at the flybys that have been done by Voyagers and Galileo and Cassini so far. And uh, then there are some indication of water blooms. It, uh, there was uh, before on Enceladus and uh, recently on, on Europe also. So it's uh, possible that we could possibly capture some sample from those blooms. At least we can do, and has been done already, some spectroscopy. Uh, then there is a possibility to send a lander and do some surface chemistry testing, right, spectro spectroscopy, and with gas chromatometry or other chemistry approaches. Finally, the hardest way is to uh, send some kind of uh, ice penetrating probe for possible ocean or water lens to do some in situ chemistry, imaging microscopy, or other tests for to test for existence of life or biomarkers there. Okay, this is Kelsey. Um, sorry, I can't get my webcam working. I'm a postdoc at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and question number four is uh, talking about various aspects of mobility of material in the ice shell of icy satellites or in the ocean as well. So I focused on Europa just for this presentation um, because it's what I work on and what I know the most about. Um, but obviously, this is an important question for many bodies, and we care about it both because we want to know about the habitability of these bodies, but also because we want to know if we can get any samples that would help us learn about this. Um, so just to have a cartoon of the like the internal structure of Europa, we have constraints on the internal structure from Galileo spacecraft. This outer H2O layer, which is shown here over a rocky mantle, so both the ocean and ice shell together are something like 150 kilometers in thickness. The actual thickness of the ice shell itself is, of course, a much discussed topic. Some people think it could be as thin as a few kilometers, um, but most estimates are something like 10, order of magnitude 10 kilometers, maybe even tens of kilometers. Um, but it's also good to keep in mind that the ice shell thickness can change over time, and likely has. So these kind of pinkish uh, things rising through the shell are an example of what might be moving material in icy shells, and that would be some form of convection, either more wholesale convection or something more localized like diapirism. So this would be warmer ice moving, uh, possibly even getting some partial melting going on. Um, and of course, we see all sorts of interesting surface features on Europa. Um, including ridges and bands, which could be indicating some kind of fracturing to some depth is occurring, um, and this broken up material called chaos. And the overall surface age of Europa is quite young. This is from crater counting statistics. So we know some of this motion is happening relatively recently um, in geologic terms. There are not a ton of impacts on Europa, but I am a fan of impacts, so I just wanted to make sure that are not forgotten because they also can move and mix material. Here's pictures of two of the largest impacts on Europa, Tyre and Kalanish. Um, and just a simple back of the envelope calculation shows that based on their size, 
they could be ejecting material from as deep as two kilometers. But of course, they'd also be fracturing and affecting deeper material. Um, and plumes have been mentioned, but this is an obvious way to get material to move around. Um, and it's exciting that on Europa, there's now hints of plumes also in the southern hemisphere from new HST data. Uh, this one is mine. Um, we are trying to consider the issue of uh, whether or not and or to what extent uh, the role of freezing and thawing um, as a cyclic process might lead to uh, enrichment uh, and perhaps subsequent evolution of complex organics and prebiotic uh, with prebiotic implications on icy worlds. Um, so I've rounded up a little bit of information about what we think we do know. Uh, on Earth in permafrost, we know that uh, periodical, periodic uh, freezing and thawing. Uh, during the thawing period of time, of course, things, um, things mix. Um, but during the freezing uh, portion of the cycle, uh, liquid pockets that remain between the ice crystals uh, become more and more concentrated with respect to both salt and uh, any organic materials that they, that they can uh, contain. Sometimes these are quite uh, large lenses of uh, highly concentrated uh, solutes in, in the water, and they're called cryopegs. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm battling flu here. Uh, these pockets of fluid um, can then melt again, and of course, and this is a transport uh, mechanism for mixing of materials and so forth. Um, the utility of this for prebiotic chemistry and perhaps even as microbial habitats is that um, it will force uh, a greater uh, interaction of chemicals, uh, compounds of interest for prebiotic chemistry, and um, they could also ultimately then serve as uh, little microhabitats for microbes uh, within the icy frozen mass. Um, when we have sporadic thawing, of course, this is where we get exchange of materials but also if any organisms on an icy body possess uh, anything like the type of uh, uh, genetic coding that we experience here on this planet, uh, this could allow for at least um, episodic gene flow. Um, but it's clear to us from, from looking at the literature that we have been able to um, interrogate that the work on these, these concentrated brine and organic pockets is uh, quite insufficient to really put this in context um, nevertheless, we think that the notions are uh, tantalizing enough that this um, is something that's quite worthy of being incorporated into uh, the menu of topics that astrobiology uh, wishes to address. Oh, that's me. Um, so we, we just were, this is, a, of course, a relevant question, um, talking about internal heating sources for any of these bodies. So we just started making a list here. Obviously, radiogenic heating, tidal heating, and early in the history of these bodies, um, heat of accretion and possibly heat from differentiation, if that is what happens um, to a given satellite. And uh, we just made a little note of when these were most important. There is some radiogenic heating remaining, but of course that was much more important early on. And tidal heating is what really keeps these bodies geologically active today. There's also plenty of um, interesting research about potential previous resonances that these bodies went through. Um, our next question uh, addresses whether or not we can uh, have any way of detecting um, subterranean or suboceanic hydrothermal activity um, should there be the actual ocean uh, that we uh, are led to believe that there is now. Um, this is quite a difficult task. We have uh, tried to um, use a creative approach to imagine what might be uh, indicators of sort of hydrothermal activity. Um, on Earth, we uh, know that hydrothermal vents have been detected um, by Beers and colleagues um, using a combination of um, conductivity, temperature, and depth measurements. 
um, which of course they're able to conduct because they have access to the surface of the ocean on Earth, whether or not this um, approach could actually be employed uh, in on an icy moon uh, remains debatable, but nevertheless it's an interesting suggestion. We certainly know that for Lloyd Vostok, which is one of the um, subsurface fluid filled lenses that I think of as caves and water ice, um, Up. it shows a clear footprint on the surface of the ice that overlies it, and this is due to uh, differential temperature effects uh, from the fact that there is a uh, encapsulated liquid water uh, right at the freezing point, um, and this apparently uh, produces this shadow flattening. Um, of course, this is a, a much thinner amount of ice um, than we anticipate for many of the other icy moons of interest. Uh, so, um, on the order of about 3.8 kilometers is the, uh, the depth of this feature, but nevertheless, there may be um, some counterpart to this on other moons. Enceladus, as I understand it, they have a much thinner ice cover. Um, we contemplated the idea of measuring the ice temperature gradients via some sort of pouring from the surface. However, on moons with very thick icy uh, crusts, this may be uh, far short of where one would actually see any kind of gradient. Okay, then there was a question about sample return from Mighty Words. Is it necessary and is it feasible? First of all, uh, is it really necessary? Uh, the easiest way the orbital spectroscopy of surface modules can tell us much, but not all science questions can be answered this way, of course. Uh, desirable of more elaborate return strategies awaits information from initial missions. Ice-based samples will require major efforts to preserve them in their original state, probably necessitating active cooling capacities on the re return voyage. So. Uh, It, it will eventually be necessary to do sample return mission if all the evidence shows that it's necessary. But is it feasible? Of course, the required delta V cost to outer solar system and return mission is very expensive. And such mission would be extremely complex. That means it's it's very expensive and difficult. And uh, that also means that about the question: Can we really reach the possible habitable location on to for required sample? So, if the biomarkers or chemistry we are looking for are under the some thick ice shell. It will be very difficult to take there. Uh, is the potentially highly altered surface sample interpretable? Or is the uh, surface sample better analyzed in the two? like in a question number three, I guess. Okay, um, our last major sub-question is uh, what are the that are in or on icy satellites might be? Um, we distinguish this into what might have been available early and what arrived later in the history of the body. And uh, in Need, what may still be arriving. Um, the high degree of variability of icy bodies means that it's um, difficult and perhaps not productive to try to consider them as a single class. Obviously, there are great differences in size, great differences in degree 
of geological differentiation. Um, we plowed through literature to try to um, pick out a few uh, tantalizing tidbits. Um, clearly, Titan um, is the poster child for a gigantic production of organic materials uh, because of its um, the nature of its hydrocarbon uh, geochemistry uh, and atmospheric chemistry and uh, fluids. So it's anticipated that it has um, very thick uh, regolith, essentially, of hydrocarbons and perhaps even more complicated and elaborate um, organic chemistry. So this is an intrinsic mechanism on Titan. Um, Europa's uh, production of salt from its interior was actually theoretically dealt with um, a couple of years ago. Um, but... Uh, the time constants for that, of course, are unknown. Um, and more recently, of course, the sodium salt um, uh, putatively from Enceladus's plumes have been detected in Saturn's outermost ring. So uh, we actually uh, appear to have a smoking gun there for export of, uh, of uh, salt. Um, there have been general considerations of organic delivery to planets and moons. There are several papers involving court and sept, and I just quote one here. Uh, there are other papers uh, coming out of that group with additional co-authors that have considered various aspects of, um, uh, of cometary organic materials, things created on cometary bodies over time, and the rate of delivery of those to uh, icy bodies and other planets. Um, certainly, we know that uh, the work very recently published in this past year by Martins and their colleagues have shown um, amino acid production um, of a significant degree from simulations of shock heating that one would expect from cometary infall. Um, we certainly know that uh, even on Kuiper Belt objects, many of whom are um, have been in the past thought to be not uh, geologically very active, but nevertheless, they seem to have significant alteration products, including hydrated silicates. So this is just a, a brief overview of the things that um, caught my attention recently. Um, but as I, as I mentioned in the first item, there is really a vast array of literature that can pertain to this question. And um, I do not believe that anyone has done uh, a review article on this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Polly again for uh, wrap up. Okay, thanks. Uh, so here, uh, here is our last slide uh, listing uh, the, all the connection to other astrobiology strategic papers that we have identified. Uh, first of all. Uh, how can a world generate and support life? How can we identify habitable environments in our solar system? And finally, the search for life on other worlds in our planetary system. So that was it. We thank you, and uh, I think it's uh, time for discussion and questions. Absolutely. So um, at this point, uh, I can see that uh, the, at least one person, Ron, has uh, already seen that you can type questions into the chat window. And in fact, he's doing that as, as I speak. Um, if anyone else wants to ask questions, up at the top of the screen, you'll see that there's a little button to let you raise your hand. I think it might be worth doing that just because we have a number of people uh, signed in today. So um, questions and observations that people want to raise. And just to remind you, the purpose of this webinar is partly to inform the community about uh, different aspects of the overall roadmap development, but also to help the authors to strengthen their papers. So any observations that you want to make on this would be gratefully received. The document itself uh, will be opened up for comments very shortly as soon as this event is finished. So, um, Gal has typed in a question. If you want to start there, that would be great. Uh, 
perhaps I can field that one uh, from from Gal. Um, all I know, since this is not my that is not my area of research, but it has nevertheless been published by um, the group that I cite here, Yusrav and uh, and colleagues in 2003. Um, since you raised the issue, I can search forward on that, and I'll make a note of that to see whether or not that has been discussed in later papers uh, that take up that issue. Uh, but nevertheless, they were postulating that and presented evidence in its favor. Other questions? You're, you're more than welcome to type, but the phone lines are also open. Um, so if you want to ask the question directly or make an observation, please go right ahead. Um, in answer to Ron, maybe somebody else wants to chime in, but yes, that has been um, suggested actually by several groups is a uh, fly through of the plume uh, for Enceladus. Um, now with the recent uh, apparent discovery of what appear to be fluid plumes from Europa that Ross and company have just published, um, perhaps that could be considered also. Um, it does not appear to me from the one paper that I've seen that the plumes on Europa are anywhere near the size of the plumes on Enceladus. Um, so they might be a more difficult target, but nevertheless, that is probably the lowest um, dollar figure for a mission that can actually get something from the interior. And because uh, they would be flying through active plumes, the material being emitted would have been exposed for a minimum amount of time uh, to the destructive forces around uh, whatever primary planet it is, whether it's uh, Saturn or Jupiter. And so I think it's a very attractive um, mission opportunity. Um, if it were combined with some sort of lander, um, of course, that would be much more expensive, but it also, of course, would give much greater uh, science payback, I think. So I say let's have some missions like that. And the timing also is important if they do do these plumes uh, so so we happen to be there on the right time I mean other questions or comments and just so you're aware the document which is linked on the front of the website has now been opened up for comments, so you can also write directly into that document. If you haven't done it before, it's a Google document, you find a section that you're interested in commenting on, you highlight the part that you want to do, right click and choose add comment, and you'll then be able to stick virtual post-it notes on there, which are extremely useful. The only request we make is that if you have a Google account, please log in first, just so that it will record your name so that the author group can get back to you if there's anything they want to clarify. And if you don't have a Google account, it would be useful if you could just jot your name down on your comment. Let me um, just point out that there only have been essentially three of us working on this paper. And uh, obviously, we are not all knowledgeable in spite of being very good with uh, literature searching. And so uh, there are many aspects of what we have addressed here that uh, we would certainly welcome additional ideas or clarifications or little pieces of literature that may have passed us by. So. We're still thinking of this as a work in progress, even though we know we need to be wrapping this up relatively soon. And that's certainly one of the useful ways that you can add comments to the document. We've 
particular links to any papers that you're aware of that the team should know about. So I can see that, uh, that Ron is currently typing a comment. While he's doing that, are there any other, um, any other thoughts that people want to raise? As I say, the phone lines are open. If you want to talk directly, you're welcome to do that as well. Carl here is mentioning the New Horizons missions, and I think definitely is relevant here. Pluto is uh, icy body. That's a good point. We uh, we didn't really consider Pluto, partly I think because um, none of us know much about Pluto, <laughs> but it's certainly uh, a very large KBO. Um, and hopefully, when the uh, when the, the uh, New Horizons mission gets there, we'll be able to flesh out some sort of uh, picture of what those bodies are like. So, Gal, if you wanted to uh, go into uh, the document at some point, and if you have uh, some ideas about uh, the Pluto and Charon system. Um, to add to the paper, I think that would uh, be very useful. And then I see there's a, a question from, uh, or a comment from Ron, uh, which is quite the case. Um, definitely there are acetylene uh, detections, supposedly. I don't know myself how robust those are. Um, but um, taking them on face value, it certainly is a constituent of the Titan atmosphere. And um, so any of the metabolic products that we know come from the acetylene fermenting dyes, um, maybe they would be at very, very small parts per million. Um, so there are detectability issues, I think, with instrumenting for such a mission. But it would certainly be... Um, very tantalizing and, and important objects um, or important compounds to put on the list of uh, detectable materials. So um, if you want, you can certainly add that to our paper. Otherwise, you can trust me to, um, to do that, uh, to try to capture the essence of what you're suggesting. Okay, uh, if there are no other points that we want to raise at the moment, um, let me just, uh, let me just uh, remind everyone, the document itself you can access straight from the front page of the website. It will be up there as the number one link for the next week. We're looking for all the feedback we can get on that, um, and this session will be uh, up on the website in a day or so if you want to review it or if there are other people that you think should be seeing the presentation and the slide pack itself uh, is also directly available from the event um, uh, on the on the front page as well um, we are reaching almost the end of our webinar series uh, we have to have everything wrapped up um, by the end of January. And once we've got that done, there will be a brief hiatus while we're uh, discussing the next move. Uh, and then we'll be moving into more of a convergent phase. Um, but we'll be briefing the community about that uh, uh, very soon. Okay, so thank you to our presenters. Uh, and thank you to all of our participants. Cheerio. Bye-bye.